All right. We are reconvening, and we have the grand opportunity to hear a key insight from each conversation as well as a bold idea. And we're going to go around the room, so hopefully whoever is reporting out for each group knows their key insight or bold idea, or, and you have your paperwork and your notes captured and so forth. Um, Evan and Monty are going to run mics and make them available for whoever's up first and second and third. And so, uh, do we have a bold group to say, we want to go first? All right. Woohoo! So I'm taking one for the team. Okay, we were number seven up there, youth leadership development, intergenerational connection, and aging with dignity. And um, our key insight is that um, at some point late in the discussion, uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, at some point late in the discussion, we observed that you know some of these other topic areas needed to be included in this topic area, such as you know equity, belonging, and and then that's kind of what led to our insight, which is to say, well, every topic area could rightfully be addressed within every other topic area, right? Which is then exactly sort of our challenge, which is to say every one of these things is connected in the interdependence. And the whole idea that we could take this system, these problems that are systemic, divide them up into bite-sized chunks, and then get in there and try to make real progress, only to like then run into the realization that, oh, it's, there's these interdependencies, and feel stuck, right? Which is, I think, a very common thing. So um, anyway, that was our insight. Um, for our opportunity, we, um, with youth development, leadership development, and with the aging, um, was essentially t t the same idea, which is to listen listen to those populations, listen to those people. So we had the idea of, of a youth convening, and, and North Sound has a youth, indigenous youth, youth convening, so like double down on that and expand that and find out what they need. Our insight was sort of like, it's a little bit absurd for us to be sitting in this room trying to figure out what youth need. Mm -hmm. Let's ask them if they want something or need something from us and then figure out how to provide that. And so, of course, for the same for the, the aging. But we just, we thought more specifically, um, really being very intentional about um, collecting stories from our elders, mm. collecting stories from elders. Um, did I capture everything, team? I'm looking more or less, OK? All right. All right. Good, thank you. Great, thank you, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna go back here, because this is where we had all of our stuff. Um, but we were group number nine, which was the equitable and accessible education systems. Um, and obviously we did a lot of writing down, but the one that we highlighted was breaking down systems at the roots, reimagining early education. Um, what are the foundations we give children? Do they uphold the systems that we are trying to dismantle? So when we were talking about that, the example that we used was when we're talking about things like toxic masculinity. You have men who, you know, are in their 19, 20, you know, reaching college level age, learning how to break down things that they have been taught from white supremacist systems. And that's great, and it's awesome that they're undoing that kind of work, but like, why are we even introducing it at a foundational level? Like, if we want to reimagine these systems and like, look at rebuilding all kinds of systems, then we have to start foundationally giving them a different perspective and a different idea from the jump. I don't know what else to say. Uh, nothing else need to be uh, said. Yeah. We had a huge group of Cynthia, Mario, and me. You know all <laughs> of them. And um, you can see we generated a lot of ideas um, regarding um, art and cultural expression as healing and social change. And one of the things that, uh, one of the key insights that we had is uh, Mario said the term edu-share. 
So edu sharing our various and assorted cultures um, in a safe space of the arts where there is an equal exchange rather than one person giving something to someone else uh, seemed really important and the radical idea that came from that was um, to have a five county north sound uh, move from county to county cultural party exchange. Um, and so we thought that would be really fun, International Food Arts Festival Dance. The other thing was, um, uh, Cynthia brought up healing spaces. So creating spaces of healing that involve the arts, silence, stillness, and nature. As we keep moving forward, can we pause and take that time for ourselves daily? Uh, the other idea that we had, and I wanted to bring this up, was um, we're talking with Cynthia about homage and our older adults. Um, before pandemic, there was, I don't feel like there was a whole lot of emphasis placed on older adults in a lot of ways. We can say that about so many different populations. But uh, during pandemic, the focus was on older adults. How do we protect older adults? Get vaccinations for older adults. And now I really feel like it's waned. I feel like, okay, they're good now. Everything's good now. But that's not true. Uh, none of us are good now. <laughs> it's ongoing. And um, we did a project uh, with Aging Well Whatcom, Chuckanut Health Foundation, called The Art of Aging. So if you want to, you can look that up. Because we painted portraits of older adults and did a one hour interview that was condensed into about five minutes per person to tell their story of growing older in Whatcom County and what that was like. And with that, we learned a lot about their lives and the commonalities that we found among all people. And I think it was really effective and a great way to honor people. Um, and then the last idea was just letting people share and celebrating those individuals through the arts responding to that. So we have lots of great art ideas and we plan on enacting them all. <laughs> all of them, yes, give them a round. So I'm Laura, and wow, wow, that's really loud. <laughs> um, Catherine was my other partner, wherever she, Catherine's at. So there was two of us. We were in group 10, um, Disability Access and Justice. Um, so looking at, or talking towards inside and bold ideas, um, we were talking about um, an ideal world in which people with disabilities would live flourishing and thriving um, and making a living wage if they were adults or living full lives as children with disabilities, so it's child age. Um, and one way to get there, we really discussed the need for more navigation of services for folks with disabilities and or families who have children with disabilities that even as um, educated professional, I with a 20 year old daughter who has autism, it's really hard to navigate the system to realize what she's qualified for, what she's not qualified for, how to get her help through high school and beyond, um, because she is bright, she doesn't qualify for a lot of things, so we, don't, we just don't know where to turn. You know, what, um, you know, thinking of disability and SSI, um, how, are, how are these children who have disabilities going to make it as adults making living wages? And it's really, I think, a, a challenge. But like I said, we need neuro neurodiversity, and without that, um, you know, we're a lesser society, so more support's needed. Thank you. Thank you. And, and our, our discussion was really built off of the idea that none of these bullet points exist on their own. And so we were examining the intersection of all of them and, and really looking at um, larger, the larger question of who are the right people to do this work? What are the voices that we're listening to? specifically the people in the community that are impacted by the decisions that people in this room make. And so how, how do people in power or people who have decision-making abilities, people who are deciding where funds are going, how do they receive feedback from dissenting voices or from voices who have traditionally been marginalized or pushed out and being willing to take in that feedback in a way where people who are providing it feel respected, honored, celebrated for what they're bringing to the table. And so just recognizing that dismantling all the isms and all of the systems that have caused harm, that it's actually creating something new that doesn't exist. So really looking outside of those systems in, and looking into what is new that is wanting to be created 
and listening to the voices of the people who are directly impacted by that as the beginning, middle, and ending point. Mm, wow, great. Yes, give them a hand. I am voluntold to represent group <laughs> two. Um, grab some notes. We didn't write a thing down, um, so I'll do my best here. Um, the time to think about uh, emergency preparedness is not during an emergency. Um, we need to pre-plan, and every emergency brings unique challenges. Um, something that we do at, at EMS is just play a little game, which is what does the emergency require? What is the severity if it, if it happens, and what is the likelihood that it will happen? Some of those might look like an active shooter events, uh, MVC or motor vehicle collisions, um, winter storms, earthquakes, fires, et cetera. So all of our communities probably have similar emergencies. But how we respond to those is unique to the community as well. Um, each of us has the opportunity before an emergency to prepare for that emergency. You can do that in your own home, and you can also meet your neighbors. If you wait for the government to respond, you may not get any help for a while. So your, your neighbors are your best help, and you're your best help to your neighbors. Some of the things to identify, food, water, um, do you need medications? Who's going to help you get those? On San Juan Island, uh, our winter storms are not that severe, but pretty likely. And most recently, our winter storms required the need for pharmaceuticals to be delivered and food to be delivered to people stuck in their homes. Add to that a wind event, a uh, broken ferry, our problems get bigger. Um, this requires the use of people with big trucks and uh, a helping hand to, to get that. And we're a small community, so we have a lot of eyes. One thing you can do in your community is just get to know your neighbors and understand what they have to help as well. So when the trees fall down on your road, you know who has a, a big truck to move the tree, who has um, chainsaws to help you move, move logs. So you're not waiting for somebody. You can take action immediately. And then after that emergency, have you learned anything? Can you adjust the way that you prepare for the next one? If we develop systems within an emergency that we can respond with, the variabilities that come up during the emergency are easy to, easier to tackle. So if you know that EMS is available, that's great. If you know that fire is available, that's great. But if a variable, a variable pops up and you know your, your neighbor can help you fix that, now you're working in this kind of creative space within a system. So create your system within the emergency, preparing whether it be floods, wildfires, we can prepare for these things, but the variables still pop up. So be ready for the variables, be strong in your own preparedness, learn from each other. Um, and we could talk a lot about climate, but really we're as strong as our neighbor. So be a strong neighbor, get to know each other. All right, yeah, round of applause. Hi, I'm Maria Santos, and a little bit concerned that I didn't get the memo that maybe an ACH -er should not be representing <laughs> partners. I don't know. That's okay. I'm not quite sure, but we were in group six, and equity and belonging. And I'm just going to go over here real quick because it was such a robust conversation. We all decided to exchange information because this needs to keep happening. We had a great conversation that started with our first insight first, namely, we might have more than one, um, the power differentials, differentials can shut down conversations. For example, rank can't remove the hat. Um, that kind of came up because of what Clarice said, that there really isn't psychological safety. Just kind of doesn't exist. And my sister is a uh, right under the assistant superintendent in Long Beach School District. And she said, if you can find out in that group how you can have psychological safety when rank is in the room, please let me know. Hmm. Because she said, that really doesn't exist. And so I brought that to the, uh, 
to our group and the, whoa, it got lively. We have a board member in our group. <laughs> we have like a veteran 30 year, you know, exec ED in our room. So um, some of the people in that don't get a chance to tell their boss how they feel were there. And they, mm. they, they kind of said it and it felt really good. And so the feedback, um, uh, if inside the organization there's not the values, um, how are you supposed to live that work? So how are, we supposed to, how are we supposed to have that psychological safety if we don't have the values in? That was a big question. So in how do we advance psychological safety, acknowledging safety doesn't exist? Having that dichotomy, how do we still do it? How do we step into that brave space without getting fired? Which was the concern, of, you know, the lower ranks. I'm just gonna use that hierarchical term just for sake, you know, um, of simplicity. Um, and when you messed up as far as, you know, higher ranks, uh, it was really heartwarming to hear board members say, we mess up, we are human, we do mess up. And when we do, the thing to do is own it. First be open to feedback, own it. Be committed to change, doing things differently. Huge thing, it was very, it was humbling, is what it was. And it's interesting, I'm using that word because it happened to me where I was told, Maria, you need to be humble. I was told that at work. And um, to hear it from the other side, I was like, okay, I acknowledge that. I heard that for the first time. This was very, very um, heartfelt. Our bold idea is, of course, continuing the conversation because now we all have our info, so that has to happen, people. And more opportunities to gather across organizations with job roles and rank in the room, practicing that. Clarice heard that loud and clear. If rank is not used to that either, how can we expect them to hear us if they're not practicing it, right? So having those opportunities where we can have those mixed meetings, right? Mix it up. And that, so they can also feel safe. They are human, right? And then, and, um, that's what we came up with. Thank you. Hope that was okay, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> who's, who's still outstanding? Right here. Thank you. Education. Um, we, are, I'll introduce myself. My name is Darcy Allen, and I'm a behavioral health and prevention fellow with Washington State University assigned to the healthcare authority. Um, I was with the uh, diverse and inclusive future peer-based skills-based workforce that centers lived experience and sustainable Work. funding for a living wage. Work. So that really long, complicated sentence full of a whole bunch of elements that are really important to all of us. Um, we had a massive, robust conversation that talked about a lot of those things, and we could have gone on for about another six hours. Um, so I hope everybody's going to take time today to go around and read all of these things so that you can really benefit from what we were able to extract from our conversations. But our key insight was if we look at our policies, our funding, our capacity barriers as they address to all aspects of building our workforce, um, we need to look at removing those barriers, creatively overcoming those barriers, and think about being on the other side, being someone new to the workforce, being a new hire, being someone um, applying for a new job within an organization, coming in laterally from somewhere else, um, and also understanding, this incorporates understanding that people under 30 have had vastly different expectations of employment and workforce and having 20 or 30 jobs in their career versus I was the first generation in my family who didn't have basically a single job their entire lifetime. Do our systems and how we've designed our, our workforce acquisition reflect single job coming through the organization or is it adaptable to people expecting to have 20 or 30 jobs in their lifespan? So really think about that. Um, and our bold idea 
which came up first, actually, this was like the first half of our discussion, is leveraging our hubs, our regional hubs, the North Sound ACH, Northwest Regional Council, um, advocacy organizations, membership organizations, our hubs of networks, our hubs of people, our hubs of support. How do we leverage our hubs to address hiring, um, share job descriptions and help each other write job descriptions or critique our job descriptions? How do we use those hubs to maybe pool our resources for offering benefits? How do we use our hubs to leverage training opportunities? How do we leverage our hubs into funding? And another aspect of that was actually leveraging our hubs for education. If we can flatten the certifications to broaden them, mm -hmm. how do we leverage our hubs to actually say, fewer certifications because they're broader, and we can train more people to have these certifications so that we can facilitate people flowing throughout public health, human services, social services, and all these aspects that intersect with it. If we can leverage our hubs, we can actually say, people are trained, they have the certifications, they have the skill sets combined with their lived experience, with their background, with their peer knowledge, with their community-based knowledge, or that they're a community health worker, and our approach to find them and our approach to hiring them can match what we either acquire them with or we help them achieve in their education to better serve us and better serve our communities. So, thank you. Yeah. Great. My name is Jack Estrada. I'm the administrator out at Peace Island Medical Center in Friday Harbor. And our group we talked about uh, number four, housing for all. That's a big, tall order. But uh, what we discussed was, uh, ob well, for obvious purposes, more need for housing, more supply of housing, pardon me. But it, it was interesting. I don't think we can forget the fact that there are people that don't think we need more housing, right? So just to keep that in mind, um, the antithesis of having more housing is there, there are people that don't think we do and, are, and put up lots of obstacles uh, about that. Uh, in some of our areas, uh, we don't even have, for example, in Friday Harbor, we don't even have a shelter, much less anything else. Um, there are different needs uh, for different types of housing. For example, there's not just the homeless that obviously need a house or a shelter or a home, but there's entry-level caregivers, employees, there's middle uh, middle level employees in our organizations. There are those that are unsheltered. There are seniors that we don't often talk about that need housing as well. And then there's transitional housing. So there's many different types of housing that we need to be able to provide in our communities. Uh, again, I'll use Friday Harbor as my example. If uh, heavily dependent on tourism, if we don't have entry-level service workers, for example, then the economy starts to fall apart, right? Uh, in the hospital, we have trouble, um, even, even our well-paid nurses have trouble finding housing, you know, healthcare workers, the house. The, so in other words, the infrastructure just falls apart, whether it's our EMS department, our hospital, our long-term care facilities, all of the tourist industry restaurants and gift shops, et cetera. So it's, it's really, when we think of housing, it's really supporting our economy at the same time. So we have to think about it in that way. Um, we need funding, obviously. We need allies. Uh, we need a targeted community of, of resources that will advocate for housing in our community, whether that's uh, our, our uh, city leaders or lawyers or fundraisers, you know, philanthropy. I mean, there's a, any number of resources that we do need. Um, and one of the things, we have to change, remove the barriers to some of the laws and regulations that prevent us from getting through permitting processes, zoning um, concerns, um, and of course, protecting our local citizens, rental caps, 
and so on. So it's, you know, as we talk more about housing, this thing is huge. It's not just putting a house on a piece of property and opening the door and saying, here you go. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, so our bold idea, um, well, I'll get, I'll, I'll, I'm going to work backwards here. So we have to dismantle the governmental system surrounding housing, like I, like I talked about, the, the, the permitting, the regulations, the barriers that get in our way. We do have to inform and educate our communities uh, why it is important for them to have available and affordable housing in their communities. Um, there are, like I said in the beginning, there are people that don't think we need more housing, but that's why it's very important that we uh, socialize and educate our communities uh, about housing. Uh, we have to procure funding to develop housing plans, perform feasibility studies for more housing on in different areas. I mean, if we go to somebody to say, you know, we, hey, we want we want to build housing, the first thing people are going to ask for, well, what's your plan? You know, what are you doing it for? What do you need? That all leads up to really our bold idea, and that's to build an ally network. Um, and that uh, is basically an anti-HOA, you know, um, I called it the ACLU of housing, <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, we need a powerful network of allies that uh, effectively just, this is what they do. They remove barriers, they help us to recognize what we, uh, what we need to bring to the table to convince people that um, no housing or not affordable housing does impact our communities. Um, I believe I hit everything. I'm looking at my partners in the room. Did I get it all? So. all right. Very good. They gave you a thumbs up. All right. all right, thank you. I am Megan Tripp. I'm a project manager with North Stone ACH, and the group I was in was human-centered data measurement storytelling and equitable funding. Um, and I want to start by thanking everybody who was in that group for sharing so freely. Um, the conversation started with a lot of examples of what data collection has looked like in practice and then what reporting has looked like in practice. So the entire conversation was very grounded in the work that is actually being done. Um, we started out talking about collecting data in a way that is not continuing to cause harm. Um, providing information about why that data is being collected, how it's going to be used to the people who are providing that data, so that people can really provide consent for their data being collected and being used. Um, and then we also talked about systems in which services are being provided in exchange for data and how that is extremely problematic. We don't really like that system, but it is something that currently exists. So we, we spent a lot of time talking about the system as it exists right now and the ways that we can approach that in a better way, but what it really all came down to was if the people who are providing funding for all of these services were asking for information in a different way, looking at information in a different way, and really trusting what people are saying they need, then we wouldn't need to be like putting band-aids on all of these different issues within data collection and reporting systems. So the term that came out of it was trust-based funding. Um, people, individuals know what they need, organizations know what they need. So if funders and payers could just trust that we, we know what we're doing, we know what we need, people know what they need. Um, that, that would be our, our bold reimagining. And I will finish with, <laughs> with my favorite quote that came out of it that is a little bit aside from the bold statement, but um, data is only information when it's put in context. I just I thought that that was, if you're in the data world, I love that quote. So, Dina, thank you for that. Yeah, yes. So, are we complete? Is that everyone? All groups have gone? No, we've got one more. I was kind of hoping you'd forget about food. <laughs> um, so, our we focused on food, environmental justice, um, and food security and Number one. sovereignty. <laughs> um, we've probably talked a little more about food security than any topic, and I think we started looking at food banks and working within the existing system. We talked about how to decolonize them, uh, more local food sourcing, more culturally relevant food for the folks who go to the food bank, and 
ideas like mobile food banks that get food to people who can't or choose not to go to the food bank. Um, we then moved into talking a little bit more about maybe how do we shorten the line at food banks. Um, and we talked about things like prescriptions for food, um, screening for food insecurity at healthcare settings, um, ideas like keeping the free school breakfast and lunch program for everyone that popped up during COVID um, to not just exist during that healthcare crisis, um, and expanding access to and the benefits from food stamps. Uh, I think we recognize that this was working with and maybe improving upon existing systems. So I think the boldest suggestion that was made might really radically get rid of food insecurity and lead to food sovereignty. And that's something like universal basic income. Um, I like the term universal thriving income better. Um, so like folks just aren't meeting their most basic needs. It's not a great acronym, but Universal thriving income might be the way to really dismantle um, this stuff. Hi. So, thanks. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> Again, there were no, there was no time off. You guys took this on. And if you're sitting here and you've got a couple of brain cells that are still working, you're kind of churning on what are the major takeaways here. All right? And you may also be thinking about, what am I committed to? All right? Which is what we all want to walk away from this experience with. Major takeaways and commitments. Because the only way this is going to go into action is if we put it into action. So at your tables, identify one other person and in pairs. Share, even if it's just one major takeaway. All right? You're only going to have four minutes. One major takeaway and one commitment, and whether that commitment is me personally, or something I can do within my organization, or a commitment I want to make in the context of the network. Share those two things with one partner at your table. You got about four minutes, so two minutes each. You guys are champs. There's a nice murmur in the room that says you are still in it. Here we are at 3.30, we're supposed to be closing, and you still want to talk about this. We got the right people in the room. So we want to invite, you know, because somebody may have something burning as we close out. And I want to make the point, this isn't just busy work. This isn't just occupy your time, space, and work, and effort, just to see this float off. You guys have real power in this room to not only take these ideas, talk about them in ways where you acknowledge the intersectionality of things. And one of the things we see about communities that are really moving on big issues like this is when they acknowledge the intersectionality, they multi-solve, they see how if we're addressing this, we can also deal with that at the same time simultaneously because if you're working at a systems level, you recognize already the overlaps, right? So what was a major takeaway that you want to lift up before the group? And or what is a commitment? Because if it is to be, all right, that you or on behalf of your organization, you want to say, this is what I'm committed to going forward. So we've got a couple of mics again still. Who would like to share a major takeaway from this conversation? or just simply something you would love to see move forward? Anyone? You guys were pretty robust a second ago. <laughs> right there, thank you. I guess uh, I'll say my commitment, um, going back to my organization, going back to my work, and being truly committed to be brave and ask for things and share. Create a place where we can, don't wait for somebody to be the hub, be the, you know, begin to do the work. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Powerful. Where's Van? Be bold, be brave. Don't wait for somebody. Thank you. Someone else, right here. I really thought about the conversations we had in our small groups, but then also what to share with each other. And for me, it's the idea that if we are supported within 
our own structures, our own organizations, whether it's professional or volunteer or personal or, or all of them, if we're supported to be able to push back within our own organization to fight for mm. creativity, mm. change, upending, whatever it happens to be, if we're supported from within to build confidence and skills for doing that, and they still have our back, then we can be supported from within the organization to push back with our outside partners. And primarily I'm thinking about, we're all dependent on this stupid concept of grant-based funding. Mm, mm -hmm. It's stupid, and there's no good reason for it. <laughs> so we can leverage our ability to be backed up by our organization and to be confident enough to say, why does it have to be this way and look like this? Can we start pushing back incrementally with good knowledge and good reasoning and to say, I'd like to try something. Don't burn a bridge, right? but you know, just say, can we try something? And I think we can start to create change by making those kinds of movements, but it has to start from being supported and respected and given, given that structure and given that respect and esteem. Great point. How many of us have had the experience of when it wasn't just me asking for something, you know, but I had this one and this one and maybe a gang behind me? That's what you have. The ACH not only has resources, but it has a voice, and that voice is you all collectively. So leverage that voice, have the creative ideas, have the creative conversations back at the ranch. Anyone else? Another key insight, key tape back there. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say, like, being honest, coming into this, I didn't have a lot of high hopes. I've been to other events that have had, you know, DEI attached to the name or, like, the word radical in the title, that it was just a lot of performative, surface level, kind of ended up being how do we pat ourselves on the back and make ourselves feel better. And like that was not the energy that was brought into this space. And it was really refreshing. And it was awesome to see like actually people dedicated to change that wanted to see like actual radical improvement and actually get to the core of radicalism. And I think that was really cool. All right.